where do raindrops come from? It's a simple enough question, right? But simple questions don't always yield straightforward answers. In this case, the answer is surprisingly complex, but it may also be incredibly valuable because scientists now believe that unlocking the life story of a raindrop may actually be the key to predicting the future of the Earth's fresh water supply. Got it again. Let's hope this one falls free. That was a nice shot. It went right over the branch you wanted it to. In 2006, researchers from the University of California at Berkeley embarked on a multi-year study sponsored by the Keck Foundation called the HydroWatch Project. It was designed to precisely monitor and measure the pathways of water in Mendocino County's Angelo Coast Range Reserve as it cycles from the groundwater table to the tops of trees and into the atmosphere. Okay. That's great because it's right in the middle of the watershed. That'll be a great vertical gradient for microclimate. We were really interested in learning the fate of precipitation in the land surface. So really trying to figure out when precipitation arrives at the site. Where does it get into the rock? Where does it get into the stream? How does it recharge the groundwater? How much of it is used by the vegetation? And ultimately, how much of it ends up in the streams and going back out to the Pacific Ocean? Through the HydroWatch study, scientists learned that a lot more water is actually stored underground in the fractured bedrock beneath the Earth's surface than they'd previously thought. Now they're working to understand how that water is used in the hydrologic cycle. One of the most important discoveries that I think we've made uh, through the HydroWatch project is the role that rock moisture is playing in regulating what gets into the stream and actually what's available to the vegetation that's growing over the top of that fractured rock surface. In 2013, HydroWatch expanded in scope to become part of a landmark study sponsored by the National Science Foundation called the Critical Zone Observatories Program. Today, there's a national network of 10 CZO watershed sites across the United States each with unique climate, geology, and vegetation. The critical zone is a pretty new term, and it really tries to capture this idea of the zone between fresh bedrock beneath our feet and the top of the vegetation, where the trees are interacting with the atmosphere. So it's everything in between. It's rock, it's soil, it's the vegetation, and it's the atmosphere that's coupled to that vegetation. That's the critical zone. It's where life meets rock. The practical reason for why we need to be studying the critical zone is as climate is changing, as lands are changing because of human occupation and human use of that land surface, we're disturbing the way the earth works. And if we don't really put a singular focus on really understanding the importance of that critical zone, as we march into the future and climate continues to change, we're not going to really understand how to mitigate for those kinds of impacts that humans and climate are actually having on resource balance on planet Earth. Scientists across a broad range of Earth life and computer sciences, from microbiologists to electrical engineers, are working together to conduct research and share data within the most comprehensive hydrologic science network in the world. We have to be interdisciplinary. We really need to be talking to the atmospheric scientists, the soil scientists, the stream ecologists, the biologists, and really try to understand the interconnections between all of those pieces that are living and are part of the skin on our planet to really understand what regulates the movement of resources through that critical zone. These expansive efforts emerged from a remarkably fundamental query. I asked what I thought was a very simple question. How old is the water in the stream? Is it from yesterday's rain? Is it from last year's rain or this season's rain? Or is it 100,000 years old? Every school child learns the basics of the water cycle. Ocean water, heated by the sun, evaporates and forms clouds, which are made up of millions of tiny water droplets. Land formations and changing air temperatures force clouds to rise and cool. This triggers the release of precipitation. The water enters soil, streams, and underground aquifers. Some flows back into the ocean. Some evaporates back into the atmosphere from plants in a process called transpiration. 
Inez Fung led the original HydroWatch project and has continued to work with what is now called the Eel River Critical Zone Observatory. As an atmospheric scientist and the co-director of UC Berkeley's Institute of the Environment, she's been on the forefront of global climate change research for more than 30 years. I like solving puzzles and the Earth is just a gigantic puzzle about how things work, why it rains, why there are warm days and cold days, where the water comes from, where the water goes, where the air comes from, and it is a marvelous puzzle. To help solve that puzzle, researchers at the 10 CZO sites scale trees and towers hundreds of feet tall and drill deep into bedrock to place sensors that gather climate information from various parts of the critical zone. Their instruments transmit real-time measurements of air temperature, rock moisture, soil water content, and stream flow. We call this the critical zone tree because it's the most heavily instrumented tree in the Sierra Nevada. We have about 150 or 200 sensors. There's a sensor for humidity, temperature. Those are sap flux measurements to measure how much water is moving up the tree trunk and going out through the leaves to the atmosphere. I'm parallel with the data logger. Yeah. <laughs> Todd side. Dawson is a plant physiologist. His part in the project is to provide information on the role that the plants and trees are playing in how water moves through the Eel River watershed. 75 to 80 percent of the water on this planet is recycled through agriculture, through forests, through the plants. You take those plants away, you remove that straw in the earth, that conduit for water to move out of the soil and back into the atmosphere, and that eventually can lead to deserts expanding. It changes the climate. We know that, for example, when trees were cut down in the Amazon, there was less precipitation. Back in his lab at UC Berkeley, Dawson pours over the watershed data like a detective looking for clues. The neat thing about water, okay. as it undergoes evaporation, condensation, or even sublimation into things like snow or ice, it changes its isotope value. And we can actually ask, ah, was that a cold storm? Was that a warm storm? Was that snow? Was that fog? They all basically have a unique stable isotope fingerprint. And that's great, because then we can use it as a tracer and really watch how water is moving through the watershed. For example, a high concentration of carbon, nitrogen, or iron indicates the water came from surface soil. Isotope ratios can also tell if water has evaporated from a plant or spent years in rocks. Knowing where the water comes from and how fast it's moving through the watershed enables Fung to create computer simulations of different weather scenarios. From these, she's able to predict how climate change might affect our fresh water supplies. We are predicting where it is warm or hot, it's going to be hotter and drier. And so that means less water available to the plants. And if the plants are not there, then we have less transpiration, less communication of water from the soil to the atmosphere, and we're in for a drought. And that's what we're predicting, uh, which is rather grim. Now there's more precipitation that's actually falling over the oceans. And the reason why that's occurring is that as humans have changed that Earth's surface, it heats up more, it pushes the moisture away from the Earth's surface, pushes it out to the ocean. When there's more water falling over the ocean, there's less water falling over the land. And we need that water on the land surface to grow our crops, to sustain our natural ecosystems. And when you combine less available fresh water with a rapidly growing human population, you've got a recipe for disaster. At the crux of the problem is one simple fact. The Earth won't ever make any new water, but hopefully keeping better track of the water we do have will help us adjust to the drier times ahead. I have to be hopeful. I think there's been tremendous awareness uh, around the world about the crisis that we're in, and I think that together we can do something about it. <laughs> <laughs>